This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University, and today I want to talk about some fatal mistakes that you can make when it comes to Bitcoin, hardware wallets, self-custody, and recovery seeds. And this video is sort of a follow-up to three previous videos, which you, if you haven't seen, might make sense to take a look at now. The first one was, should you convert your ledger to a paperweight, in which I argued that the risks of using a ledger hardware wallet at this point really outweigh the benefits followed by this video about how to move your Bitcoin from the Ledger hardware wallet to a Jade, a Blockstream Jade hardware wallet. And as part of that, you'll use a software, a desktop or laptop software called Sparrow Wallet, which I talk about in this video. And I'll link to all three videos in the description notes below so that you can catch up. And here's the basic progression. You have a hardware wallet, which is a device that holds your Bitcoin private keys safely offline. It interacts with some software, some sort of software interface that then connects to a Bitcoin node, either your node or another node on the network. And this is how you connect your hardware wallet and interface with the Bitcoin network itself. And what I'm going to argue in this video, and I've argued in previous videos, is that it's a good idea to use different software to connect your hardware wallet to a node. So you could just use Trezor plus Trezor Suite, or you could use Blockstream Jade plus Blockstream Green, or you could use Ledger plus Ledger Live if you don't value your security or privacy. The problem with this is you're trusting the same company with both your hardware wallet and the software. So I think it's better to use a hardware wallet in combination with Sparrow wallets. You can use Trezor plus Sparrow, Jade plus Sparrow, or Cold Card plus Sparrow. That way both the hardware wallet manufacturer and Sparrow software need to collude in order to hurt you. So it's much better to pair your favorite hardware wallet with Sparrow and then use Sparrow to connect either to your own node or to a Sparrow recommended node, which I talk about in that Sparrow video. My favorite hardware wallet is still the cold card. Blockstream Jade is also great. It's available at a lower price point. It doesn't have as many features. It's a little easier to use. doesn't have the same advanced features that cold card has, but still a great product. Trezor is also probably fine if you have an old Trezor, but the problem I have with them is that it's a company that still supports scammy altcoins, and that's a huge moral compromise that they've made. If you're using the version of Trezor that supports altcoins, you have a much wider attack service. I understand now they have a Bitcoin-only wallet, which I haven't tested. That might be a good choice. But if you're going to go out and buy a new hardware wallet, I would definitely go get a Blockstream Jade or a cold card. If Trezor dropped all their altcoin support, I would definitely start recommending them again. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future topic, and also share this video with a friend or family member. In the video about moving your Bitcoin from Ledger to Jade, I made this point, which I want to reiterate here. Remember to never share your 12-word recovery seed with anyone, never upload it online, never enter it into a web form, never take a picture of it, never allow your smartphone or computer camera to view it, etc. Anyone who has your 12-word or 24-word recovery seed can instantly steal your Bitcoin. Unfortunately, that did not stop some viewers from not paying attention and losing their Bitcoin. This is Bitcoin Hopium. I, I don't want to call him out or embarrass him, uh, but he did post this publicly, and I think it's a very sad story. He looked, he went to a Telegram group for Sparrow, and he found what appears to be a fake Sparrow uh, support desk or tech support desk, and then he ended up giving them his seed, his 12-word seed or 24-word seed, and of course they took his Bitcoin. Sparrow, if they do offer a help desk, which I don't believe they do since it's pretty much a one-man shop, but if anyone ever asks you for your recovery seed, you can be sure that they are a scammer, so please do not do this. Your recovery seed can also be referred to as a recovery phrase, your Bitcoin backup, your backup, your 12-word backup, your 24-word backup. It's basically the human-readable version of your private keys and can be used to reconstitute reconstitute your entire Bitcoin holdings and transaction history and basically reconstitute the wallet and then also can be used to sign transactions that move your Bitcoin to a different address. So it's very, very important to guard this and keep it safe. It will look something like this. It won't be the same word like this. Don't use this as your recovery seed. Uh, your seed should be generated by the random number generator inside your hardware wallet. But this is an example of a 12 word recovery seed. This is sort of a famous example. And the list of words, the English list of English words, there are 2,048 words that are possible. And they come from what's called the BIP 39, the Bitcoin Improvement Proposal number 39 list. And so I'll link to the GitHub site for this in the description notes 
below. And basically, there are a huge number of combinations when you take 12 or 24 of these words, especially if they're randomly generated. You don't want to go through here and pick out your own words because that won't have enough entropy, entropy or randomness. But this is where the English words come from for your recovery seed. Never ever do these things. I'm going to reiterate them again and sort of elaborate. Never enter your seed into a web form or anywhere online. Never upload it to Google Drive or Apple Cloud or Evernote or any of these services. Never take a picture of it, especially a digital picture. Never say it out loud when you're writing it down. Never send it via text or an email. Never allow a computer or phone camera, a computer camera or phone camera to view it. Never display it in a public place where there are many smartphones and surveillance cameras. So for example, you don't want to work on your recovery seat in a Starbucks or a McDonald's. That'd be a really bad idea. You should do it in a room that's been completely cleared of electronics in your own house. And you should put some blue tape or some tape over your camera phone. I'm sorry, your uh, desktop or laptop camera when you do it. Also, as I've mentioned before, no one at Trezor or Ledger or Cold Card or Blockstream or Sparrow or anywhere else will ever ask you for your seed. If someone asks you for it, you can tell right away that they're a scammer. Again, if anyone has your seed, your 12 words in that particular order, they can immediately sweep your Bitcoin to a Bitcoin address that they control and your Bitcoin will be gone forever. And there's no one you can complain to to reverse this transaction. It will be done forever. There are problems too with memorizing your seed, memorizing your 12 words. If you need to cross a border, maybe you memorize them temporarily. But I think it's a mistake because some people talk in their sleep. Some people take Ambien and do crazy things. Some people get drunk or high and do crazy things. This is the problem with having your recovery seed in your brain when you don't really need it in your brain. So I think this is, uh, this is one of the risks. The other risk is if you're attacked or tortured, if that seed is in your brain, you will spit it up under torture. If you memorize it and don't have a physical backup anywhere, all it takes is one strong blow to your head, a car accident, a stroke, death by other means, and your seed and thus your Bitcoin, your recovery seed and thus your Bitcoin is lost forever. So I would say the best practice is to stamp it, engrave it, punch your seed into a stainless steel or titanium piece of metal and store it in a safe location. You can put it in a tamper-proof bag like these banker bags uh, that look like this that you can tell if someone has opened it. You can also look at the reviews of different seed storage devices that has been compiled by Jameson Lop. He's really done a service here and he goes through all the different brands and writes down their price and how they break down, how they're good or bad. You, I'll also link to this in the description notes below where he talks about his philosophy behind these metal plates and what you should use and what you should not use. And the conclusion is really you should use a stainless steel plate or a titanium plate and this and you should punch or stamp your recovery seed into it. It's much better than having plates or tiles or something like this that can fall out. And the nice thing about stainless steel or titanium is they it won't rust and it can sustain it can sustain a lot of pressure, it can sustain a fire or floods. But Jameson goes into all the details in these two articles which I'll link to in the description notes below. I also wanted to mention a lot of people have been telling me that there are scammy ads before my YouTube videos. Obviously, I have no control over these ads. These are ads that are served up by YouTube really on an individual basis. And so it will depend on your own characteristics and your own viewing history and all the information that Google has about you. But there are two ads that seem to be showing up a lot. I believe this this ad has finally been taken down. There's a, a Michael Saylor. It obviously wasn't him, but it was some scammer pretending to be him and giving giving viewers a QR code and asking uh, them to send the Bitcoin to this address. Obviously, that was a scam. You should never do this. And then there was someone else who mentioned that there have been some XRP Ripple ads before my videos. And again, I have no control over this, unfortunately. And unfortunately, Ripple has a lot of money because they scammed all the retail investors by dumping their pre-mined tokens on them. And so they have a huge marketing budget. Please ignore these ads. I have no control over them. And this is a Bitcoin only channel. And again, never send your Bitcoin to anyone because you're not going to get it back. One last note that I'm going to discuss in more detail later this week. Transaction fees have been very, very high on the Bitcoin network. And when you're viewing this, they may be high or they may not be. But when you move your Bitcoin from the ledger to the Jade, it may not be a good time to do it right now. You may have to wait for slightly lower transaction fees. And these are the fees that are paid to the miners in addition to the block subsidy. There was a comment that was made here, which is not true. A lot of people say that the transaction fees are done as a percentage of the Bitcoin that you're transferring. This would be 
this would be similar to a credit card fee, for example, where the merchant pays something like 3% of the purchase price, but it's not actually done this way. Transaction fees are a function of the amount of data that your transaction uses and the amount of block space used, as well as how fast you wanna get it included in a block. We're gonna talk about the mempool. We're gonna talk about block space later this week, but there's, there is um, a lot of misinformation out there. Some people think that these transaction fees are being charged by Ledger or by Blockstream Jade or by Cold Card. They're not, they're actually Bitcoin miner fees. And these transaction fees will really vary if you do something on, if you make a transaction on Sunday at midnight, it may be lower fees than Monday morning, etc. The block space, the blockchain has really uh, been receiving a lot of ordinals, a lot of inscriptions. We're going to talk about those as well. And this is one of the things that's been driving up transaction fees. But I just want you to be aware of that. Again, it's not a percentage of the dollar value or the Bitcoin value of what you're transacting. It's more a percentage. It's more a function of the free market competition for block space. And this is actually one of the best spam mechanisms that the Bitcoin blockchain has, where you have to pay to have a transaction included. We're gonna go more into depth in that later this week. Finally, just a word of uh, encouragement and uh, a message not to get frustrated. Here is a comment, I don't really wanna embarrass this person, uh, but this, this comment was, this is all so freaking confusing. I was super proud of myself for getting a ledger, setting it all up legit by my non-techie self, and now I gotta figure out some more stuff, F that. I think it's important to remember that we're still all very early, even though Bitcoin is almost 15 years old, we're still really in the early adoption Phase and the learning curve for Bitcoin self-custody is still quite steep and requires time and patience. So don't be too hard on yourself. Try to keep getting better and learning a little bit more every day. And take your time. Don't stress out. Definitely don't be in a rush and do something stupid with a Bitcoin transaction where you do the wrong transaction or you share your private key, your recovery seed with someone just because you're really stressed out or in a hurry. The path to self-sovereignty is difficult at first, but it definitely gets easier over time. So don't be too hard on yourself, and but realize that this is an, a never-ending journey, and we're all going to have to keep learning as the Bitcoin network and the whole Bitcoin ecosystem keeps growing and changing. So this really is a journey of self-education that we're all involved in. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video, and let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.